Well, I don't know if you've attended a party about the revealing of the gender of an expectant child that's becoming popular. How many of you have ever been at a party or waited to find out is it going to be a boy or a girl, right? You know, parties are very popular now to reveal if it's going to be a boy or a girl. And in our own family, my nephew and his wife are having their second child. And, and we, we had that on Christmas Day. We found out, you know, if it was going to be a boy or a girl. And if you Google it all, you know, there's all different ways you can have these parties today to uh, have the big reveal. Will it be a boy or a girl? Well, if you take that idea of the big reveal to our celebration today, the Feast of the Epiphany, because the, the Epiphany is really the big reveal. That's what it is. That's what we celebrate. If we call it the Epiphany, if we call it the visit of the astrologers or the magi, the three kings, whatever title we wish for the day. There's many different titles for today, but it's really the, the big reveal. And if you uh, look at the word epiphany, it comes from two Greek words. The first Greek word meaning on or upon, and the other Greek word meaning to appear or to shine. So it's to, to appear upon, to shine upon. It's really what epiphany means. And uh, what is the big reveal? The epiphany really refers to the divinity of Jesus. Shining upon the earth. It's the manifestation of Jesus' divine nature. It's really the, in every pure sense of the term, the big reveal. God himself becoming man. With the epiphany, we, we focus on many different things. Of course, we focus on the star. We focus on the journey of the uh, wise men. We focus on the gifts. And we focus on the worship. Because what is it that these three magi did? They bowed down and knelt in worship. All of this really calls us to focus not inward to ourselves, but rather causes us to focus upward to the kingdom of heaven and to see where the kingdom of heaven is coming to earth. And uh, today we heard again from our good friend, the prophet Isaiah. We've been hearing from him, you know, all through Advent. We've been hearing from him through the Christmas season. We hear from him again today. And what is uh, Isaiah telling us today? Very clearly, that the Lord shines and appears in his glory. That's what Isaiah is telling us. Isaiah is foreseeing a day. When the divine light will shine over all of God's people. Isaiah is saying that this divine light will attract all nations. And all will be grateful for this light. The presence will draw not only Israel, not only the chosen Jewish people of the Father, but all people from distant lands and distant cultures. It's what Isaiah is telling us. And we need to see that Isaiah is really uh, beginning the big reveal. He's almost sending out the invitation, I suppose, to come. Because he is uh, writing in a time period of disaster. We remember that the kingdom is divided. The kingdom is destroyed, really. The Israelites have been in slavery. Very dark days. And here comes Isaiah with this great message of hope and light of God manifesting himself to his people. If you take that to the, the psalm that we sang, Psalm 72, very clearly, plain English, every nation on earth will adore you. Plain English, the worship, the adoration of the Magi. And really, Psalm 72 is really describing the prosperity and describing the utopia, the peace, that existed during the reign of King Solomon. This psalm was really about King Solomon. And why was there great peace? Why was there utopia? Why was there great prosperity during the reign of King Solomon? 
Maybe we scratch our heads and say we need a little of that right now. Well, the answer is very simple, because Solomon was faithful to God. That's why they experienced peace and, and uh, prosperity. Solomon, we know, was the one who wanted wisdom when he was asked, tell me what you want. I want wisdom. Wisdom. The wisdom of the Lord. And so, Solomon and the psalm about Solomon, the prosperity of the time and the peace of the time, really a foreshadowing, another invitation of the big reveal, because it really is preparing us that Jesus Christ, one of the successors of Solomon, of King David, would come and begin the new Jerusalem. And who is the new Jerusalem? You are. I am. We are. The church. So when we hear about the new Jerusalem, it's, it's you and me. It's all of the disciples of Christ. We are the new Jerusalem. And the second reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians continues the, the whole big reveal. Paul speaks of the mystery being made known. The grand reveal of God's mystery to the universal world. Paul's letter today tells the Jewish people then and tells you and me today that the uh, mystery of God is revealed to the world, including the Gentiles. That's you and me. We're the Gentiles, you know. Including us to the entire world. He's reminding us that we're co-heirs and members of the body of Christ. He's reminding us in the three kings, really a, a little foretaste of the gathering of all of the nations that form the new Jerusalem, the church, the body of Christ. And what about these gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I have heard so many jokes and stories about these gifts over the years, it's not even funny. And I mean absolutely no disrespect to the ladies present, but many of the ladies would say you could tell with three men who brought the gifts because they didn't bring anything practical. You know, <laughs> we would have brought practical things, right? You know, and we wonder about these gifts. They really wanted to do something, bring them a camel or a donkey so they had transportation, you know. They really wanted to do something, get Joseph some new tools or at least a gift card for, you know, Lowe's or... Value or Home Depot of Bethlehem, you know, so he could get something he could use. Or, you know, maybe bring some clothes for the baby. You know, get a gift card for Carter's, you know. Uh, let, help him out with something practical. But these uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh are really very important. Gold showing the royal nature of Christ, his kingship. He is the successor of David, Christ the King. Frankincense used in worship. Sacrifice points to Jesus' divinity, his priesthood, and the myrrh, an ointment used for burial, showing that Jesus' is humanity, he will suffer passion and death. Now, in case you're ever on jeopardy, I'm going to help you out here because I'm going to give you the answers to the quiz today. Question one, where... Do we ever hear about gold and frankincense besides in the Gospel of the Three Kings? There's only one other place in the Scripture that we hear about gold and frankincense together, and that was in the first reading. Prophet Isaiah, chapter 60. And so Isaiah very clearly is doing the big reveal. He's setting us up, saying, this guy is the one. He is the one we're waiting for. He is the light. And question two, where else in the scripture do we hear about gold, frankincense, and myrrh, all three, besides in today's gospel? There's only one place, and it's in the Old Testament, the Song of Songs. We hear about those three elements being prepared. The nuptial perfume used by who? King Solomon and his bride as they prepared for their marriage. So, in these three gifts, we really are reminded of the nuptial union that we have with God. The nuptial union, Jesus Christ is the groom, you and me, the members of his body, the church, the new Jerusalem, we are his bride. We're the bride of Christ. Epiphany is really about the coming together of 
the human and the divine. That's what we really celebrate today as we celebrate the Epiphany. And so now all that theology is out. What does it really mean for us? What does all this really mean for us today? Well, like Israel, during the time of Isaiah, the kingdom is in ruin. The kingdom is in ruin. The very land where Jesus was born is in the midst of war. He was born in Palestine. He was born in Bethlehem. It's part of Palestine. The very path, the Gaza Strip, which we've seen destroyed and countless children murdered, is the exact path that Joseph took Mary and Jesus to safety in Egypt. The kingdom's in ruin. In a very physical, real way, the kingdom is destroyed. And the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, the church, we got our problems. Administratively, we have issues. But not only administratively, remember all of the baptized are the church. And the kingdom has got many areas of ruin. I will not ask for a show of hands. How many of you, because you are here practicing faith and worship, how many of you have ever lamented that somebody in the family got married and it was not within the church? How many of you ever lamented that someone was born into the family and there was no baptism? Members of the very body of Christ are not coming forward to the nuptial union in their own marriage vows at the altar. And many members of the body of Christ, the church, are not bringing their own children to the Lord to be grafted to be a member of the body of Christ. We're very thankful because we got young Micah in row one who's going to be baptized right after Mass. So we're doing all right. But we have to remember there are problems. Yet, in the midst of all these problems, if I didn't depress you enough, in the midst of all of the dep- problems, there is great light. 2.4 billion Christians exist in the world, 50% of whom are Catholic, about 1.2 billion Catholics in the world and somewhere around 130 will be 1.2 billion and one, you know, as as we add Micah to the fold, (laughs) you know. Faith is in a decline across the board in the United States. I don't care what religious tradition or denomination. We're all experiencing the same issues. And in many areas of the Western world, the same is true, yet the faith is exploding in areas nations of the world where they were never allowed to hear or practice belief in Jesus Christ, most notably Africa. Our seminaries are closing and Africa has bursting numbers of seminarians. There is great light. And as I told you many a time, there's great light right here at St. Greg's. At the last Mass, we enrolled some 90 young people for their first penance. And... Uh, You know, we have 14 in our CIA preparing to be initiated at the vigil. Kristen, who's our, our, I can't see Kristen beside the tree. I've lost Kristen through the trees. (laughs) You know, and applications for religious life. We have two seminarians from the parish. There's great light. There's great light. Simple question, who are the Magi today? Who are the Magi today? Well, I think on one hand, they're the scholars. They're those individuals who are really dedicating their entire life to studying the Scripture, to study and come to deeper understanding and share what they have learned by way of wisdom. They are the Magi today. As the Magi sought Christ the King, true wisdom. But you and I, we're, we're called to be the, the Magi today too. We are called to pursue a study of our faith. We're called to pursue studying of the Scripture, adult education, opportunities in youth and young adult ministry, retreats. We're called to pursue, just as the Magi did on that day, to pursue the Lord and to grow not only in knowledge but to grow in humility. 
So a couple questions. Leave them rhetorical, no hands. Simple question. Can you quote the Scripture more or less? Can you quote the Scripture more or less than you can quote the statistics for the Buffalo Bills? Now, I too will be watching the game today, so it's nothing against them. But I was in school the other day, and I, I heard a couple of the students quoting all these statistics about the bills. And I said, my God, I hope you're able to quote the Scripture with the same efficiency that you're quoting all of this. And, you know, when we look at uh, the epiphany, where are we with worship? Do we really bow down and worship the Lord? Do we really uh, come to worship God or or perhaps just see it as something we have to do every week? Do we really worship God or do we sometimes place higher worship on political, human, secular thought and belief? What is it that we really worship? To be politically correct and socially correct or to worship God? What is it that we worship? Do we really speak with a free love and admiration of Jesus Christ to those that we meet, talking about our relationship with the Lord, or do we want to just keep that private? The Magi didn't keep it private what they were doing. So the, maybe the simple question, who is it that we worship in life? Do we really worship Jesus Christ, or do we rather worship some political thought, social thought, athletic ability, or other circles. This is what we celebrate today in the Epiphany. We, we celebrate the big reveal that you and I are called in this place and time to be the big reveal of Jesus Christ, His light in the world today. And we do that first and foremost by the way we come to worship Him. Not only each and every Sunday, but every day of our lives and in every facet of our life. That is the Epiphany Alive today.